again, brother, we, we pray for you all the time, and uh, we uh, are glad that uh, you've got another year notched up. Not quite yet, though. When's your birthday? All right, uh, the, the ice cream thing's off. Uh, no, we'll still have it. We'll still have it. I thought it was upcoming. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we still love you and still pray for you. And we'll be happy to celebrate your birthday, uh, even as, if it's a, a past uh, event. All right. Well, the verse that uh, we've been using for our study, Looking for a City, comes out of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. I'll just read it again and pray. And then we want to look tonight uh, at uh, our home going. I just entitled this uh, Welcome Home. Well, what's it going to be like uh, when we get to heaven? Uh, how, we, we talked last week how we got there. Uh, and now we're going to talk about our entrance uh, into uh, that city. Abraham, look for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open up uh, the spiritual eye, our spiritual eyes so that uh, we might see and understand uh, what uh, you have prepared for us. Uh, God, give us a glimpse into that heavenly city and, and uh, what our eternity is going to look like. Encourage us uh, by your Holy Spirit tonight and, and uh, show us uh, truths and insights that uh, would do just that. I pray a, a very special blessing on each person that took the time to uh, come out and away from their homes and into your house uh, to study your word. Now, Lord, we pray that uh, what we say and do would be honoring to you, uh, that you'd guide us and direct us in all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's a, an absolute fact. I don't know a whole lot of things for sure, but I know this for absolutely sure. Even before your loved ones begin to sorrow uh, here on earth, you'll be rejoicing in heaven. Save people I'm talking to, of course, uh, tonight, uh, that uh, you're there so, so instantaneously that, uh, that the sorrowing won't even begin down here, uh, but yet you'll be in heaven. Uh, you'll enter heaven in an in a, in a instant, uh, and there will be absolutely... No loss of consciousness. In other words, uh, you won't go into a, a sort of a dream state or a stupor and then uh, have to be revised like coming out of anesthesia or something and begin to recognize the things. So as soon as you close your eyes in death, the Bible says, the, the next blink, you'll be in heaven. And you'll, ha you'll, you'll understand, you'll, ha you'll, be the, you'll be the same person uh, that you were here. Uh, and uh, except, of course, you'll be uh, glorified. Uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, that Jesus not only awaits us there, Jesus escorts us as our great shepherd. John 10, 3 and 4 says, He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. He goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. And that's how we uh, enter heaven. That's the same way we left the world and came into the earthly kingdom of God, we heard the voice of Jesus calling us by name, and we answered that call, and he led us out of the world and into his kingdom. And the same thing happens at death. Uh, he calls for us, uh, and uh, he leads us, and we follow him. Uh, we talked last week a little bit about uh, poor Lazarus, Lazarus and the, the, the rich man, and uh, how the angels... Uh, attended his ascent uh, in, into heaven. And so uh, that's an interesting concept uh, as well. You know, it's a glorious thing. It's a glorious thing for God to have people come home to where he is. It's not a sad thing. All the sorrow is down here. It's nothing but rejoicing forevermore for us. And so the angels who never had an opportunity to be saved because they never needed to be saved. They were holy angels. Uh, this is, these things amaze them, the Bible tells us, that they watch on earth uh, at church services like this uh, so that they might better understand this whole concept of 
salvation. Uh, and uh, to have someone come from earth into heaven is a great time of celebration uh, for the angels. And so we're led there by our great shepherd. We're accompanied by the angels. Hebrews 1.14 says, because angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. And so angels are involved in our lives here uh, at the dis dis uh, discretion and will of God. Uh, we, we don't know these uh, things necessarily uh, when, when they happen. So it's not a surprise, I would think, nor a stretch of the imagination to say that these same ministering angels that watched over us in life accompany us into heaven, which they know so well. You remember the story back in the mid-50s of the uh, five um, Transworld Radio missionaries that were killed in Ecuador. It was it made famous by a book and a movie, Through Gates of Splendor, by one of the widows. Elizabeth Elliot wrote that book. One of these five uh, missionaries, Nate, uh, 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 Nate, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm going to get his name right, Nate Saint, his son, Steve, made a, a movie. I think it was called The Tip of the Arrow or something. You can find it on YouTube uh, and watch that. He went back to these, uh, this tribe that had killed his dad and his dad's <coughs> four companions. Uh, and these uh, people gave testimony to the fact that while the slaughter was going on, while the murdering was going on, that they saw f above this uh, creatures that they never couldn't recognize and never saw before. Uh, but now that, they, now that they're saved, they realize that these were uh, angelic beings over this scene where these men were killed on this sandbar. And one of them even said that there was a, there was a kind of noise or or sort of music that they had never heard before. And uh, this woman said that uh, the next time she heard it, she never heard that kind of uh, music and singing uh, until she attended a church service and heard the, the songs being raised up. And she recognized it immediately as being the same type of singing uh, that she had heard on that sad bar while she hid and her husband was engaged in, in that slaughter. So that's just one instance, but it's a very uh, interesting thing. We, we, we spent some time last week talking about <coughs> angels, but, uh, you know, my point is this. Uh, heaven is so amazing, and it's going to blow your mind. I mean, we can't understand it down here, is, is what I'm saying. Uh, even the things I'm going to say tonight... Uh, much of it is speculative <clears throat> based on the Bible. I tried to base it on uh, uh, the Bible, but the fact of the matter is there's not a whole lot known because I think that we wouldn't really understand it. If God would, how could God ever explain to us? Our only reference point is earth. So how could God ever explain to us uh, heaven? And this is why Paul says, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them uh, uh, that love him. And so we're going we're gonna to attempt that tonight. And uh, I'm not going to make it a point of doctrine uh, for you to believe everything that I'm going to say. You can, you can have your own ideas. I, as long as your ideas are attached to the Bible, you and I will be fine. So we're not going to going to wrestle each other or break fellowship over uh, something. If I say something that you don't agree with, hey, just uh, love me and, and just give me a break and uh, just say, well, you know, preacher, he gets, he gets kind of carried away sometimes. So, uh, you know, it's, it's fine with me, but I've done my best in this study tonight to try to lay out for you not just speculation and wild uh, uh, stuff, but things that uh, I think relate, have a Bible basis to it, and uh, I'll leave it to you to agree or, or disagree uh, uh, with that. Uh, the greatest reward, and we'll, we're going to spend another study in the, what kind of rewards we, will, we uh, are awarded in heaven. But, the, of course, the greatest reward of heaven is to see Jesus uh, face to face. Uh, uh, he's the only one that will have a resurrected body with scars on it. Oh, your appendicitis. Uh, a scar be gone. Uh, 
uh, everything will be good. But Jesus will still have the scars in his hands and his side because we know that when he resurrected, he told Thomas, he said, see my hands on my side, come thrust your hand uh, in. Uh, and so it will always be before us that we were saved uh, by grace. We'll see his, see his face, we'll see his hands, we'll hear his words where he says to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so there's a chorus in our book. We didn't sing it tonight, but I was reminded of it as I prepared this little study. Uh, and I'm sure you've sung it or you've heard it sung before. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. That's the first thing that we're going to see. Uh, that's, uh, that's going to grab our attention uh, because he's the most important one in heaven. Uh, D.L. Moody made, had a famous quotation, and I'll just read it for you. He said, soon you'll read in the papers that Moody is dead. Don't you believe it? For in that moment, I will be more alive than I ever have been before. Uh, and, and so... I think of that, you know, when you pick up the paper and you read the obituaries, and I kind of wonder to myself, uh, now some are, have a testimony in there, and you go, well, praise the Lord, they have a testimony, and, and uh, they give some of the things, that, uh, in things they were involved in and stuff, and others, are, they just get the brief one, the one that's for free, that you get, that gives you a name, and when you were born, when you died. And, uh, and I think, well, I wonder if that person's saved. I wonder if that person's in heaven today. Uh, one thing I know is everybody on that obituary page is someplace. And it's based on their decision they made down here. And it's not based on anything else. It's based on their decision they made down here. So I was thinking, what, 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 it, what is our character like? What will be we be like? Will we all be the same? Uh, or what do you think our character be like? And so I prayed about it and, and tried to lay out some stuff. And here's some things that I consider to, to be absolutely true. And that is, number one, or A, our personal traits continue. Now, <clears throat> we'll still have the same personhood that we were born with, but it will be sinless. Well, obviously, we're not bringing any sins with us, uh, anything wrong with our personality uh, that's tinged by sin will be eradicated and cleared up. We, we won't take sinful uh, ideas and uh, feelings and other things uh, with us uh, to heaven, uh, but uh, our, our character, our, 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 the, our personal traits will survive the death of our body because that's who we are in our soul and spirit that's who we are we'll we'll take uh on a a god ordained personality uh but uh it will be uh, perfected the personality you were born with uh is the personality you're going to take to heaven all right now many people's personalities have been crushed by sin through tribulations and through uh, encounters and, and various things. The, sometimes our personalities are warped by the, but no one was born with a warped personality. Everybody was born with a God given personality, which we can nurture. Uh, uh, it should be, our parents should begin to do that, nurture those personalities, uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Uh, but you and I, need to consciously work on our personalities as well, uh, not falling to the tr into the trap that says, well, my past made me the way I am. Uh, you need to repent of that idea and ask God to, to renew in you uh, a right spirit. This is what David uh, prayed for. But our, the, the personalities we were born with were going to take to heaven in a perfected way because that will be the real you. When, what, when we all get to heaven, you get to see the real me. I get to see the real you, what, what I should have been, all right, and what you should be. So we're not automons, uh, robots, or zombies. 
uh, walking around in heaven, you know, with no free will or anything like that. No, we're, we're us. We're us on a grand scale. It, we're, we're us as the way God intended us to be before sin corrupted us. We know this because uh, even Adam and Eve, in their perfect state, uh, had characters, characteristics and personality. Uh, why was Eve in the garden and, and uh, Adam wasn't there, you see? I mean, they weren't in lockstep uh, with each other. Uh, they, uh, they communed with each other, but they, they had their own personalities and their own ideas. That's what makes a, a marriage a, a great thing. I mean, if, 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 the, if everybody in the marriage thinks alike, then somebody's not needed. I mean, you know, I mean, there's got to be some, some contrast. And so I believe Adam and Eve had, had a personality in their perfect state uh, and with different interests and in personalities. So our character traits will go with us. Also, our personal knowledge continues. Uh, our minds and memories go with us to heaven but again, they'll be cleared from any sinful influence and more focused than ever before. But you'll still have memories in heaven, and you'll still be able to think in heaven. Uh, heaven does not change how much we know. All right? uh, we bring what we know about God with us to heaven. Now, there'll be, I'll get into this in a minute, there'll be time to add to that knowledge but the fact of the matter is, we need to get to know uh, our Savior here, uh, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You don't want to get to heaven and, and not know anything about the one that saved you. Uh, you want to start learning more about him. But what you know now, or what you know at the time of death, is what you're going to bring into heaven because we'll be there in an instant. You see, in heaven... Uh, what, what we know uh, will be clarified. So I'm not saying uh, people say, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to find out what happened to Amelia Earhart <laughs> or some, you know, where they buried Jimmy Hoffa, uh, something like that. Uh, you, you won't be befuddled by those things. That, that, those things will be absolutely meaningless uh, to you. As a matter of fact, you'll, you would have forgotten that you even cared uh, about, you know, uh, what happened to these, uh, these characters uh, on earth. This is not the kind of knowledge that you're going to be gleaning, this sort of, sort of uh, earthly trivia, uh, pack your brains full of that thing. No, it's going to be heavenly knowledge. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I am known. And so you're going to be able to meet and greet saved family members and friends that you knew down here. Uh, we're also going to be able to meet Bible characters that you read about in the Bible. Uh, that's going to be uh, very interesting. Will you be able to ask uh, questions to these people? Absolutely. Not everything that happened in their life is recorded in the Bible. Uh, they'll give you some insight uh, you know, uh, how many workers did Noah have? Uh, you know, the Bible doesn't say how many workers, but we assume that he and his three sons weren't the only ones. Uh, so you get to ask them that. You get to, you'll pick up a whole bunch of, of knowledge like that when you meet these Bible characters and meet your friends and relatives and family members. And we'll meet other people known only to God, people that uh, have lived in another country than the United States of America uh, that were persecuted for their faith, perhaps, and died in a prison cell, uh, unknown, buried in an unmarked grave someplace. God knows these people, and they'll be in heaven, uh, and we'll get to meet them, and we'll be introduced to these people who we never heard of and never knew, and we'd be able to hear their story. You say, well, preacher, there's uh, billions of people there. Well, we've got eternity. I mean, we got all we got all the time of eternity to to figure out all these things and to to learn from other people. So there there'd be no need for name tags that we're 
we're going to reinstitute that uh, next Sunday, our, our name tags, but uh, uh, there, there won't be any name tags in heaven. Uh, you'll, you'll know uh, no formal introductions are going to be uh, needed. Uh, we know that because when uh, Elijah, uh, Elijah and Moses met Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter knew them immediately who they were. Let us build three tabernacles, uh, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you. Uh, he knew exactly who they were. Well, maybe he'd seen a picture of them. Well, no, this was uh, 2,000 years ago. They, uh, nobody was, no cell phones, nobody was taking pictures. Uh, nobody made paintings of, of these people. Uh, how did he know them? He knew them because it was a, a small picture of what I'm talking about. When we get to heaven, you're going to know Elijah and Moses. You won't have to say, hey, hey, pastor, who? Who's the guy with the long hair, you know? I mean, uh, you, you, you're going to know that, uh, you know, just, just as, as surely as you know other people in heaven. Of course, in heaven, we're not going to know everything because this kind of knowledge only belongs to God. Only God knows everything. So, so we'll never get to a point where we'll know everything because that's in, that's in God's domain to, to know everything. But we're going to know a bunch more than we do now. And the accumulation of our knowledge is going to be ever expanding all through eternity. We're going to be learning and learning and learning and learning, and we'll have the capacity to learn that. These young people sitting here and they go, man, is that going to be on the test? I mean, you know, I can only learn so much uh, in, in my little brain, uh, teacher. Uh, so if it's not going to be on the test, I, I, I have no room for it up here. Well, that won't be that way in heaven. You, you'll, you'll have expanded knowledge and you'll be able to bring all this in and bring it back to your memory. Wouldn't that be great? You know, uh, boy, well, who, was, who is that? Who is that guy? Who is that guy? Man, I can't, I can't think. I have to run find my wife in heaven. Say, hey, who, who is that guy with the long hair over here? You, you knew him, you see. Uh, that won't happen in heaven. Uh, our, our minds will, will work like they ought to work, and uh, uh, especially uh, in, a, in a celestial setting like that. Well, some, some people ask the question, uh, Pastor, will, will we know what's happening on earth? Well, there's just, I, the Bible doesn't say, all right? However, uh, let me just quickly add this. Uh, perhaps we'll know some things that are happening on earth uh, having to do with the spiritual realm. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about so you can see what I'm trying to say. You remember in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, the martyrs were under the altar, those that had been killed during the tribulation, and the Bible says that uh, and, uh, the, the souls of those that were killed for, you know, for Jesus' sake were under the altar. And they cried out, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwelleth on the earth? So they were aware that the final judgment had not come during the great tribulation. And they were asking, had a legitimate question for the Savior. How, how much longer? Because you said you were going to avenge our blood. And it hasn't been done yet, uh, and we were just curious on how much longer it's going to be before you do what, what you say. So there's some indication uh, that uh, that has to do with a, with a spiritual thing. Uh, but there's an, another interesting verse in Luke 15 and verse 10. It says this, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, it doesn't say that the angels are rejoicing because they would have no reason to rejoice because they don't understand salvation. They've never been saved. But there's rejoicing, the Bible says, in the presence of the angels of God. So there's only two other groups that are there. Uh, either it's the Trinity who's rejoicing, and, and it very well may be the Trinity, that's rejoicing over the repentance of sinners, certainly Certainly, uh, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit who are involved in salvation would know when someone is truly saved and they would be rejoicing. But let me just throw something into the mix here just for your consideration. What if it's the other people in heaven? What if it's announced that Uncle Louie got saved? You see? Wow, man, I've been praying for him, and he's, he'll, he's coming to heaven you see, 
Maybe that's the rejoicing. So, so I don't know if uh, people, there'd be no reason for people in heaven to look down on the earth to see anything. That would be too heartbreaking. Uh, why waste the time when there's other uh, more important and spiritual things to do? But it's interesting that there, there is some kind of communication because there's jo- rejoicing before the angels over one sinner that comes to repentance. And so our loved ones uh, most likely uh, cannot see us on earth. Uh, uh, but absolutely and most certainly, they cannot communicate with us on earth. All right? Now, you've heard and I've heard numerous stories uh, about a bereaved mother who lost a son or a daughter tragically and was grieving over that. And, uh, and they give the testimony that uh, the daughter came that night into my room and said, Mother, don't worry about me, I'm, I'm fine, or something like that. Listen, I, I'm not, I will, would never tell a bereaved person, you didn't see and hear what you thought you saw and heard. But let me just say that God very well may comfort people uh, with these types of visitations like that. But I'm certain that, that living people do not come back, and com- uh, dead people do not come back and communicate with living people because the Bible absolutely calls that a sin. And God's not going to be engaged in sending dead relatives back to you for, uh, for your comfort. Uh, however, uh, God may just may comfort you in your heart and mind with a, with a kind of visitation like that. Not that we deserve it and not that he does it for everybody. So I'm not discounting that and I, I would never tell somebody, no, that didn't happen. Because if it comforted their heart, and, and made them at ease with the death of a child, then praise the Lord and, and fine. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And God is a multifaceted God, and he certainly could do that if he wanted to do that. I heard a story one time I thought was very interesting about a little girl that uh, uh, asked her, her father, uh, Daddy, can, uh, can we pray to Jesus so that he would get a message from me to grandpa, her grandpa just recently passed. And she asked her dad, just a small girl, five years old or so, uh, can we pray to Jesus and ask Jesus if he'd give a message to my grandfather? And the father thought that over and kind of thought about the theology of that. And he said, you know, uh, I really couldn't think of, of a reason why that couldn't be done. Uh, I mean, praying to Jesus uh, is what we ought to do, and he is a mediator. And so if it would comfort a little girl to send a message of love to her grandpa, uh, he said, I don't see any reason, sweetheart, why we couldn't do that. And they prayed together, and she, uh, she gave a message. She asked Jesus, Get, tell my grandpa this or that or whatever it was, was on her little heart. But one thing I know absolutely certain, that you can't pray to your grandpa to get a message to Jesus, all right? It may work the other way around. I don't know. I don't know. And maybe for a five-year-old theology, uh, there, there's some comfort in that. Um, but I know that you can't, you can't pray to Grandpa. You know, Grandpa, tell Jesus, come help me. You, you, need, to, you need to pray to the Lord Jesus and not, not, to your, not to your grandpa because Jesus is the mediator and the one that has the power to do that. Okay, here's the third thing. Uh, personal love continues as well. Now, obviously, death breaks the ties of love uh, on earth, but these same ties will continue to heaven. This is important to understand. If you have family and friends that you love, you need to pray for their salvation and work towards their salvation with all that you have, knowing that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, You should pray and pray and pray for the salvation of your family members and friends. If God gives you an opportunity to speak to them uh, regarding that, then you you should step through that open door. Uh, I'll tell you a story about my, about my brother uh, I, I, that I prayed for him for 
I don't know, I think it was, it must have been 35 years. Uh, but I had been praying for 20 years or so. And uh, he may not know this. I don't know if I ever shared this with, with Tim uh, or not. But we're, we were at a wedding. And I uh, forget now who, who it was. It's one of our nieces, I think, or something like that. We were in a beautiful church, uh, Episcopal church. And they, they, Episcopals do it upright, buddy. They, got, they, had, a, they had a nice, nice church. Uh, and and it, was, it was a really nice stained glass windows and all that, you know. And, and, and I remember sitting there with my brother praying uh, for his salvation. And it is as if God spoke to me and said, I heard that prayer, and I'm going to do that. Uh, but it was another probably 10 years or, or 15 years before my brother called me up on the telephone uh, to tell me that he had prayed and asked Jesus to be a Savior one Sunday afternoon uh, after church. I got that phone call. I prayed for another 15 years after that. But God gave me assurance in my heart that, that he had heard that prayer but these are these are mysterious things uh the reason i'm just telling that little story is don't stop praying and never come to a point that says uh you know uh, a son or a daughter or a grandchild or or someone else uh a, a co-worker or friend uh neighbor uh, that they're too far gone and uh i prayed now for six months for them and uh they're, they're not saved I, if they're not going to get saved now i guess they're never going to get saved you need to continue to pray, continue to ask, and, and seek the salvation. Praying with the assurance that Jesus said, if you ask anything according to my will, I will do it. And the salvation of your friends is the will of God. We read that this morning. For it is the will of God, even your sanctification. So God wants to save, but God is sovereign and God does it the way he wants to do it but that doesn't eliminate the necessity for us to join in uh, not only with a verbal witness but also uh, with uh, with prayers well no break in love uh, in heaven uh, there's a continuity of remembrance and thoughts uh, the, 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 your spouse uh, uh, your child that's deceased uh, your mother and father that have gone on before you, you'll get to heaven and you'll have complete memory of these. You'll, you'll recognize them instantly just as you would on earth and you, 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 you'll have a, that love will not, it was, it was, when it was broken down here as you left your deathbed and the family wept for you, that same love continues and will be renewed in heaven. All right? This is important to, to, to uh, understand, to uh, kind of build up your own heart. Now let me quickly add that sinful memories are going to be left behind. All right? And this love that's renewed for friends and family uh, will be uh, fonder, purer, and more sweeter than it was, ever was here on earth but it, you you won't have regrets you won't have uh harsh uh, memories uh all that will be taken away all that will be taken away you you'll, you'll just not have those things it will be a christ-like love a pure love that we, that you'll be able to pick up and the moment you enter heaven you'll be able to pick up that love and it will it will be the kind of love that <clears throat> if it wasn't that way on earth it will be that way in heaven a, a a pure sweet continuing love is all the sinful memories that we left behind and our love for god will intensify you know we think uh, that we 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 wane a little bit you know jesus told the church, uh, he said, you know, I have this against you that you've left your first love. Sometimes we walk away from the Lord a little bit. I'm not saying we lose our salvation. I'm just saying we, we don't love the Lord like we used to love the Lord. When we get to heaven, not only will we love the Lord like we ought to, but we'll grow in that love for the Lord. Well, that, because that kind of love will honor God as we grow in that kind of, 
uh, of love. Now, Matthew 22.30 says this, Neither will they marry nor be given in marriage. And so that begs the question, well, preacher, when I get to heaven, will I be married to my wife or married to my husband? Uh, and uh, the answer is no, no, not in the earthly sense. Uh, Jesus said this to explain the fact that they tried to trick him and said, you know, this woman's been married seven times, you know, in, in heaven, who's she going to be married to? And Jesus said, you're not going to be married to anybody in heaven. But that doesn't mean that the relationship between a husband and a wife, a child, a grandchild, a mother and father is going to be any different than it was on earth. It just won't, it, it just won't take the uh, sort of the, the picture of a marriage because on earth, marriage is a picture, the Bible says in Ephesians, of Christ and his church. Right? That's why we, that's one of the reasons that we marry on earth, to show the world what the church's relationship as the bride is to the bridegroom, Christ. And that's why uh, God really frowns on, for example, uh, marriages that dissolve and, and remarriages again. And uh, we'll, we'll preach it when we get to heaven. What, well, the fact of the matter is, if it was settled down here and forgiven down here, it's, uh, it's not going to go with you. And so I'm just going to let God be God, and, not try, and I'm trying not to be God, uh, because I don't know the answers to all of these things. But I know that we won't be in little groups our family groups will be together, but it won't have the same relationship. The, the love will be there, uh, but the, the kind of relationships won't be there. Uh, for example, children, obey your parents. All right? well, that, that, that is an earthly construct. Uh, that, that's, that's not part of heaven. Uh, we'll all obey the Lord. Husbands, love your wife. You see? Uh, wives, obey uh, your husbands. Uh, these are earthly constructs. When we get to heaven, it will be a purer thing than that. Something that I can't explain because I don't even really understand what it is. But you're not going to be disappointed. All right? So don't say, oh, preacher, I thought I'd be still married to my, my husband. Well, yeah, okay, in a sense, but very much unlike what you experience down here. Okay? Uh, it's going to be a brand new thing, new and improved. Can I use that phrase? New and improved. Uh, you'll know them, you'll love them, you'll spend eternity with them, the relationship will be great, uh, uh, all sorrow will pass away. I mean, it will, it, it will just be uh, something brand, brand new that God creates uh, for uh, his children. If he, if he wasn't going to do that, then he wouldn't have marriage down here. If it, if it was going to be a distraction in heaven. Marriage is an earthly construct. And so uh, we won't be married. However, now let me quickly add this. And this is needed in our day and time. We'll still have gender. All right? Because God, Jesus said, in the beginning God created them male and female. All right? And we'll be recreated as male and female. We won't be some uh, unisex uh, kind of a group of people. Mom will still be mom. Dad will still be dad. We'll still be men and women. And so here's my understanding of transsexuality on earth. This is the big thing where they make these poor little boys and girls, the moms and dads decide for them at an early age that they, they're going to be a girl or going to be a guy or something like that. Then they begin ripping out uh, organs and transplanting stuff. And, and uh, listen, let me tell you this. That, well, I can't say with authority, but I doubt very seriously if that mom and dad's going to be in heaven. All right? With that, kind of that, that would do something like that to, uh, the Bible says that children are a gift of the Lord. All right? And if you gave me an Xbox and uh, I tried to turn it into a toaster, uh, and you came over to my house, and you went, what in the world's going on? Well, you know, it did, I just thought it'd be happier being a toaster than it would a 
Xbox. Give that back to me. But don't ever ask me for another present. Well, you see, God gives children to, uh, uh, to people. And so whatever they were born as, whatever you were born as, you spend eternity as. God recreates that and puts everything uh, back together, and you're, we're still men and women in heaven. Spouses and families, as I said, uh, are, are reunited and joined together in a more in a different and more perfect way than they are down here. Uh, I remember in the book of Job, uh, Job goes through all his trials. Then we get to the to the forty uh, second chapter of the book of Job, uh, and God gave Job back twice as many of what he had lost. The Bible says, and the Lord gave Job twice as, as much as he had before. Uh, and it lists that, you know, cattle and, you know, there's a long list of things that God gave him back. Twice as many cattle, twice as many sheep, twice as many whatever it is. And then it ends by saying, he also gave Job seven sons and three daughters. Well, he had already given them seven sons and three daughters, and they had died. Why didn't he give him, uh, why didn't they, they, they give him uh, uh, 20 children? He just gave them the 10 back again. Why did he, if you're going to double them, why not double the children? Well, the answer is the children were in heaven, and he was going to meet them up there. God gave him uh, 10 more children, for down here, but he didn't give them t- double the children because they were already alive. They, ne- they died f- on earth, but they were in heaven. And so they're going to be doubled, but they're going to be doubled in paradise. And so it's the same way uh, for us. If, we're, if, a, if a mother loses a child, uh, even in a stillbirth, uh, that child will m- meet that mother uh, in, in heaven. Uh, well, what about our feelings? Will our, our feelings uh, continue? Uh, well, we know and have said that our traits, personal traits continue and our personal knowledge that we gain down here continues and our personal love uh, that we cultivated down here is perfected and follows us into heaven and our feelings also continue. And the overwhelming feeling that you're going to have <clears throat> is joy, just absolute, perfect Joy, joy, as Peter said, unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable and full of unex- unexplainable. Uh, take the most joyous moment that you ever had. I mean, as a child, when the, just think of the, the, the most joyous moment that you ever had. And then multiply that by, you know, X amount of, of, of times, all right? I mean, if you can have that experience on earth, that joy, that moment of joy is going to fill your eternity, except it will be that plus a whole bunch more. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Right? You're not going to sit on a cloud and pluck a harp and yawn and go, man, you know, I wish I had something to do around here, you know. Uh, No, you're going to be full of joy. And if before someone says, oh, uh, that's not going to be any fun to have that that, that much uh, joy uh, all all the time, let let me just ask you to go back in your memory to that time that you thought of where you had great joy. And you did not, while you was having that joy, say, Man, I'm glad when this is over. You know, you said what? Oh, I hope this never ends. I wish this could never end. There's heaven. That times, you know, some factor, huge factor. That's heaven, and it's never going to end. And that's when you and your that your joy that you experienced down here expanded many times over will never end in heaven. That will be the most intense feeling that you have. King David put it this way in Psalm 16, in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. There's, there's a picture of heaven, but it's, it's also a picture of our communion with God down here, but the greater fulfillment of that 
is uh, when we're in heaven, and there'll be fullness of joy. We've never experienced fullness of joy. No matter how joyous you ever were, it was not the max. When you get to heaven, it's going to be maximum joy, the fullness of joy, King David uh, said. Now, let me quickly add this, that there will be sorrow in heaven, right? Because without sorrow, th then you, you would never be able to contrast uh, what joy is, all right? But it will only be momentary sorrow, just a moment of, of sorrow uh, until God himself puts an end to it. Now, how long it lasts, I don't know. I'm, th I'm thinking it's going to be just momentarily, my thinking is. Why, why let something like that into heaven and extend it to any length of time? The Bible says this, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more sorrow nor crying, for the former things are passed away. And so as we enter heaven, uh, there will be a momentary uh, sorrow and crying. Uh, but then God himself will wipe away those tears and they'll never come back again. You mothers, uh, when your children were little, and they scrape their knee or bump their head or something like that, and they had those big old tears rolling down their cheek, and you, you would take your handkerchief or a tissue, you know, and dab them and wipe them off and, and comfort them, and <laughs> then they'd feel better, all right? That's the picture that, that's here, you see? Uh, when, when we realize what God has done for us, I believe it, it, will, it will affect us in an emotional way, uh, almost to a point of, of sorrow. Uh, this momentary presence of sorrow reminds us of God's saving grace. There but for the grace of God go I. When we think uh, about those uh, in 2 Peter 1, 1.4 uh, that have escaped the corruption that is in this world. It will dawn on us. Heaven. Heaven. All the corruption of the world left behind. That, that, that affects us emotionally. And then we remember uh, the words of our Savior when he talked about uh, those... Uh, uh, that were uh, in hell, where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, we won't think of them all through eternity, but a moment will come, I believe, into our mind that we were saved from weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, I thank the Lord for saving me. Lord, thank you for saving me. I think, that, I think that's the kind of, uh, of sorrow uh, some people, I've heard some preachers say that uh, those tears were uh, at the judgment seat of Christ uh, where you uh, learn what rewards you could have won and didn't win, and you were sorrowful for that. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. That may be part of it. But I just think the bigger thing is when we realize, wow, heaven, here I am, here I am, you know, uh, just like that, that preacher that gave me his story that, that was on his deathbed. He said, I've, I've preached about it my whole life. I've never done it justice. Uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that's going to overtake us uh, in our feelings. And here's something to think about as well, and that is our activities will continue. Maybe you never thought about this. Because rest, yes, does not mean inactivity. You do a lot of things while you're resting. You read a book, uh, work a puzzle, you know, I mean, that's rest. You don't just like, you know, like a narcoleptic or something, just conk out or something like that. You sit down, you rest, you do something that's interesting. Rest does not mean inactivity, all right? Uh, so in heaven, I believe that there'll be art, there'll be science, there'll be music, all enhanced and enriched. Why would God give you a talent and not allow you to bring it to heaven. Things that you enjoy, things that you're good at, and you'll get better at it. <clears throat> the, the artist will be able to expand his or her horizon in such a way and have the skills to finally put down on canvas what they had hoped to put down on earth. Uh, the composer 
will be able to compose for the glory of God uh, songs, people that can sing will be able to sing for the glory of God. Uh, all these things will be eternal and ever expanding uh, while we're in heaven. They'll, <clears throat> they'll, they'll all flourish uh, by the power and for the glory uh, of God. And so you may have latent uh, talents and things that may be exposed uh, in glory. Uh, but you're not going to be bored is what I'm saying. You know, boy, you're not going to say, boy, I wish I could paint. Boy, I wish I could pray the trombone. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's not going to happen. You, you're, you, you are going to have creativity in heaven. You may not, it may be latent here, all right? And maybe it wasn't allowed to flourish here. But when you get to heaven, uh, you're going to have an expanded ability in these things. You see, uh, death does not end our service to God. It simply expands it into new experiences and new duties as we serve God down here in heaven, we'll serve him even more up there, but in a new and more glorious way because our service will be motivated by a new and purer love for God. Uh, we will spend our time uh, not in inactivity, uh, but in rest, visiting and fellowshipping with God. Right. Well, wouldn't that be something? And with other people. Uh, we enjoy to do that down here. We're going to have a fellowship time here in a few minutes and, you know, walk around, talk to each other. And This is on earth. Well, wait till we get to heaven. There will be opportunity after opportunity for that. Uh, our friends will still be our friends. Uh, and we'll make more friends up there. There won't be any cliques. You're not p part of our group. You know, get out of here or something like that, you know. It's like, yeah, come on over, you know. Uh, There'll still be friendships, there'll be love, there'll be all of these kind of things. Now, let's close by looking at what kind of body we're going to have, all right? Now, there's a couple of schools of thought on this, and the Bible is not really clear, but I'm absolutely convinced about what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can get your own, uh, have your own opinion on the thing. And, and that is this, uh, that one day we'll have a permanent resurrected body. But that's not the body we enter heaven with until the rapture, all right? At the rapture, the dead in Christ shall rise, and then we that are alive and remain shall be called up together uh, with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so uh, that's the permanent resurrected body. But what about your loved ones right now in heaven? What kind of body do they have? They don't have a resurrected body. They've got some, something less than that. But still, uh, it's, a, it's a temporary body, but I believe it's still a, a body. Uh, again, uh, not every theologian, Bible student uh, uh, believes uh, this, but I just can't help but think that Moses and Elijah had a form when they came down to earth uh, that was recognizable. So I just think that you and I are going to have some kind of temporary form that's going to be recognizable. It may be just a prototype of a resurrected body. It may be exactly like the resurrected body, but, but not permanent kind of a thing, uh, but, but a sort of a prototype of it, a beta model of a, of a body or however you want to say it. We, we know that the Bible tells us that those in heaven right now have eyes because God wipes the tears from those eyes. And they have eyes because they'll be able to see Christ and others. They'll be able to see the glory of heaven. So whatever our temporary body, it has eyes. It, it has a tongue and, and mouths and lips to communicate uh, with each other and with the Savior and to sing and to worship and to do the things that m mouths, tongues, and lips do. Uh, there's some kind of a body because the martyrs that were under the altar, Jesus, it said that Jesus gave them robes to wear, white robes to wear. So, you, you know, you don't, you don't drape it over something that doesn't have some type of form. And so this, all these things, that when you combine them, uh, tells me that we have some kind of, of body up there. Now, others believe that our souls and spirits uh, don't, do not have a body, but they function as a body would function. All right? 
well, that's fine. And if you want to believe that, that's, uh, that's fine with me. And again, uh, when we get to heaven, you can come over to me and say, well, preacher, you were right that night that we were talking about that. Uh, no, I, 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 don't know, I don't know the definitive answer on that. But whatever's true, I know this, that one day everybody in heaven that's in heaven today will get a permanent body. All right? And we know more about that, our resurrection body. God created us body, soul, and spirit. And when we're recreated in our permanent resurrection body, we'll be body, soul, and spirit. Uh, Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15, As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So there, there's the answer to the question, however you want to interpret it. Uh, interpret it. We all have bodies down here, and we'll all have bodies up there. Down here we have earthly bodies. Up there we'll have heavenly bodies. Now turn to your Bible as we wrap this study up uh, and find 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, I'm aware of the time, and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to move quickly uh, on this. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and find verse 42. All right. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. And so our bodies are perishable down here, but they'll, our permanent resurrected bodies will be imperishable. They'll never die. They'll never degrade. They'll never age. All right. Uh, there's a continuity, though, uh, between earthly bodies and heavenly bodies, just like there's a continuity between the kernel and the stalk of corn. The kernel of corn doesn't look like the stalk, but they're related. The acorn is related to the oak tree. It doesn't look like an oak tree, but it, it has the makings of an oak tree. Your body doesn't look like the heavenly body, but there's some relationship to it, just as it is the, the uh, acorn, for example, to the oak tree. Uh, Preacher, how old are we going to be? I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say, and I don't know, and this is the reason I'm not going to answer it, because it does not matter. It, it, it do, let's just leave it to God. I've heard all kind of things, and so have you. Uh, do little babies stay little babies? Uh, do old people get young again, though they stay old? Uh, there's a million questions that I cannot answer. And you cannot answer, but here's the best answer. Who cares? You know, as long as we're in heaven, let God, I, it, whatever God decides to do is going to be absolutely fantastic. And so we'll just let God uh, be God. Everything else is speculation. And I could go on for another 10 minutes speculating on things that people have written and uh, that I've read and other things like that. But the, the bottom line is uh, age is an earthly construct. Age is not a heavenly construct because age is eternal. Heaven is eternal, and age makes no difference and, and has no part in heaven. We'll let God, Amen, figure that out. Then in verse forty-three, it says that we are sown in dishonor, but we're raised in glory. You know, I saw something on uh, TV, a, a news thing, and they had found a, a decomposed body someplace. And they'd put it in a body bag and they was putting it in an ambulance uh, or the morgue, I mean, the, wherever they put the dead bodies. Anyway, somebody was holding up a sheet uh, like this. And always, you know, if somebody dies in a hospital, you know, they pull a sheet. Why? Because we die in dishonor. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see that. We, 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 we don't uh, expose people. We don't roll them down the... Uh, down to the mortuary, uh, laying naked on a on a hospital cart. Out of the way, out of the way. You know this lady died, and uh, we got to get her down to the morgue. No, we. I mean, uh, dying is a, that's a dishonor. Uh, I preached many funerals, uh, and and I've gone to uh, as many. And often when I go to a funeral, I'll look at a brother or a sister in that casket, and I'll think. They don't look, they, that's not her. They don't look a bit like her. And people come by and say, oh, don't she look good, you know? And I'm thinking, man, that's not, that's not the sister I knew. 
the sister I knew had a big smile on her face. She was full of life. Her, ar- her eyes uh, twinkled. Uh, she was always willing to do something for somebody and serve the Lord. That's not her in that thing. Now, I'm not saying we had not have an open casket or something like that. But the fact of the matter is uh, they never look, uh, the deceased never looks like they ought to, like they looked, you know, when you knew them. Uh, kind of a thing. It's sort of uh, disappointing. You know the old phrase, well, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that, you know? Uh, Why did we have that say? Because it's like uh, after you're dead, it don't matter what you look like, but that thing, that outfit's so bad that that I don't even want to be buried in that. That's not the last thing, you know, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't be dead wearing that. Uh, And I I go by, when I preach funerals, I go by dear brothers and sisters that I've known for years, served the Lord for years, and uh, I think, uh, man, you know, uh, that was a good brother, but, you know, they didn't, they didn't do him justice, uh, you know, the way they laid him out uh, like that. I spent some time and paid my respects. Uh, that's the human thing uh, to do, but the fact of the matter is I'm, I've never been impressed at an open coffin, right? So, uh, and I won't be at yours either, you know, say, wow, man, that mortuary did a great job. She never looked that good in her life, you know. You know, that, you know somebody might say that out loud, but that, that's not the case. By the way, it don't matter. They're gone and in heaven. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm, you know, a whole preacher had not a joke about something. Well, now if they were unsaved or something, maybe a different story. I'm talking about saved people that I knew and served the Lord with. I was sad to see them go, and I was glad to pay my last respects. But the fact of the matter is, I never knew them when they looked like that. Uh, they had rosy cheeks and sparkling eyes and, and uh, were serving the Lord. And that's how I want to remember them. And uh, that's why the Bible says we were sown in dishonor, but will be raised in glory. When we arrive in heaven, our bodies will be glorified. Romans eight eighteen. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Then verse 43 says, we're sown in weakness and raised in power, no longer restrained in heaven by temporal forces like time and distance and exhaustion. Uh, There's limits to what we can do down here, not in heaven. Uh, We'll be able to move from place to place with ease just like Jesus did. Uh, Remember, he walked through doors. We'll be able to do the same. No no hindrances of, of material of forces down here. You'll never bump your head in heaven, you know. Oh, man, Lord, why did that happen? That, that Stuff like that's not going to happen. That's not in your resurrected body, you see. We know that because of what Jesus told his disciples. Behold, he said to them, my hands and my feet, it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And this is another indication why I think that in heaven, even our temporary bodies will have some type of form and function to them. But until then, we must be about our Father's business. It's good to stop of an evening and say, uh, preacher, let's talk about heaven and talk about what we're going to be like up there. And it was refreshing uh, tonight to do that. And I was glad to lead us in a little study. But the fact of the matter is, we're not there yet. And so we've got a job to do. We need to encourage others. We need to help others. We need to to witness uh, to others and uh, bring as many people to heaven with us as as we can. The Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. And then Daniel 12, 3 says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So the idea, of course, is is that... uh, if we're wise people, we'll win people. All right. And Paul says that just as the stars in heaven differ from one degree to the other, so will save people in heaven shine in a different way. Wise people that bring people with them and influence people for the kingdom of God will shine like stars forever and ever. And so we need to send people uh, on to heaven, uh, even before us. Uh, Jesus says this in Luke 16, Make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, money, 
All right? Money. Uh, that when ye fail, that is, when you die, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So the idea is we give sacrificially, for example, to the uh, missions. And then I shared the testimony this morning about having, because of your faithfulness, having the money to send for that project so that guy can get his things up online and reach out in the community, even in the midst of this uh, virus, and, and reach into homes and stuff. And no doubt somebody, if not many, will be saved through that ministry. And when you get to heaven, they'll, somebody will be there to greet you that got saved through that ministry and say to you, Northside Baptist, you're the ones that bought my preacher, that computer. You know, I got saved through that online classes that he has and served the Lord all these years. They'll be there to greet you, you see. Like I talked about this morning, if you take everything God gives you and spend it on yourself, you're not going to have anybody uh, in heaven uh, to greet you. But if you'll be a good steward and do something that will affect other people's lives, they'll be there to welcome you, the Bible says, uh, that they'll be there uh, to, to welcome you into everlasting habitations. For what is your, Paul says, for what is our joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? You know, if you're a soul winner, if you influence people for the kingdom, uh, you're going to receive a crown of rejoicing from the Lord, but the people themselves will be your joy and crown of rejoicing. Thank you. Thank you. Remember that day at work out in the parking lot, and, and uh, I was having such a hard time, and you came to me, and, and you explained to me that God loved me and, and that, that I could have a personal relationship with him. Uh, you know, uh, I never did tell you that when I went home that night, God just spoke to my heart, and, and, I, and he broke it. And I prayed and asked Jesus uh, to be my Savior. Um, you, and you, ha you left that job not soon after that. I never had an opportunity to tell you, but I want to tell you today in heaven that because of your witness, I'm here today. See what I'm talking about? That's the kinds of things that await us as well. On our way to heaven, taking as many people as we can with us. Let me give you one illustration and we'll pray and close with this. You've heard the song, uh, Must I Go and Empty Handed? I don't know, we don't sing it. It's a hard song to sing. It's an old song. Uh, back in 1870, uh, a, a, a pastor named Charles Luther heard a, a fellow pastor tell him the story of a young man that he had led to Christ. Uh, he was homeless and in, in ill health and soon fell sick within a month of his salvation. And the pastor upped him, visited him in a public hospital, and uh, the boy told him, just a young boy, young teenage boy, he said, I am, saved of, I am saved of that, I'm sure, but must I go with empty hands? He's talking about going into heaven, because as soon as he, he was saved, he was stricken, and uh, in bed. and he told this story to uh, Charles Luther, and it was Luther who wrote uh, the words to that old hymn that we sing. Must I go and empty-handed, thus my dear Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him. Lay no trophy at his feet. Must I go and empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty-handed? go. And so the fact is, is that we're saved to serve and we need to influence other people for the kingdom. All these things lay ahead and that should be an encouragement for us to live holy lives before the Lord and to get as many people as we can to follow us uh, into heaven. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your, your word and uh, what it teaches us. And we thank you for the assurance of heaven. Uh, and we too, like Abraham, look for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. God, we're yours, we're your children. We love you with all of our heart. 
We desire for you to lead us and direct us in our lives <clears throat> that we might live pleasing to thee. Lord, thank you for Northside Baptist Church. Uh, thank you for this time of, of fellowship. And as we celebrate uh, Jesse's uh, birthday, uh, God, that you would bless the food and our time together. All this in Jesus' name. Amen.